here. Okay. So tonight we're going to talk about self-care for the caregiver, and that would be everyone here. If you are taking care of someone, you have to first remember that you've got to take care of yourself. So let's talk about this. How many of you in this room have ever flown on a commercial flight? Okay. Before it takes off, they tell you how to buckle your seatbelt. They tell you where the exits are and how to properly put on the mask if in the event you lose cabin pressure. They always say, secure the mask on yourself first and then if there are children or someone else who needs help, then you help them. Right? Okay, so what is the key in their speech? when they're telling you all this. You. Yourself first. So why is it that when you're taking care of someone else, you forget yourself first? That is the biggest thing. And that's what's hard for most of us. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about why we need to take care of ourselves first. These are some of the effects of what can happen to you if you don't take care of yourself first. There's sleep deprivation, poor eating habits, failure to exercise, failure to stay in bed when you're ill. Oh, I just gotta go down there and make breakfast for mom. Cause she's gonna be expecting those grits and eggs and nobody can make them like I can. Okay, grits and eggs, they're kinda basic. I can't do it, but you know, they're kinda basic. Um, feeling confused. Because when we're sick, we're sick, and there's no other excuse for it. Difficulty making decisions, headaches, we're always overwhelmed, but when we're not feeling well, that feeling of overwhelming gets worse. Mood swings, we fail to make appointments, and even worse, we fail to keep them. Uh, crying, difficulty concentrating. Putting yourself first, we need to first identify the barriers that um, are affected by this. What happens? Um, we feel that we have to do these things because we need the recipient's care or their approval. Really? Do we really need their approval? Mm, yes. Studies show that care of the typical caregiver is a female somewhere 45 years old generally who works outside of the home, um, spends more than 20 hours a week providing unpaid care uh, to both parents, and most are married and living with a partner and caring for children. Now what my sister and I call that is the, um, we call that the sandwich generation that person that's caught in the middle, the middle class really, that's that person who has to take care of mom and daddy, also has to take care of the husband and children. My parents are fortunate. They have one daughter who's married, one daughter who's not married, no grandchildren. So we really don't have an excuse not to take care of them, but they're pretty self-sufficient. Um, you cannot stop the impact of a chronic or progressive illness but what you can do is you can deal with the personal responsibility that comes with it and make sure that your own needs are met when caring for this person. Many times attitudes and beliefs from personal barriers stand in the way of caring for yourself. So what you have to do is ask yourself, what good would I be um, if I became ill? If you became ill, what good would you be for the person that you're caring for? None. None. really. None. None. I could The other question you need to ask yourself is, would it be so terrible if I asked for help? Would it? You got to learn to put yourself forward first. To move forward, you first got to learn how to reduce the personal stress. Um, Set goals. Once you've learned to identify those personal barriers that we talked about, 
um, and start to in, inflict self, good self-care, you can begin to change your behavior and move forward one small step at a time. These are tools that you can use. Reduce personal stress, set goals, seek solutions, <coughs> learn to communicate constructively. Ask for help and accept it. Don't just ask for it and then when somebody gives it to you, say, oh, well, you know, uh, I think I'll just wait. Talk to the physician about you. Don't just always take mama and daddy to the doctor and ask about them but not about you. If you've got that little twinge that's always kind of right there, you need to find out what that is. Um, start to exercise. I'm the wrong person to tell you this because I hate exercise. <laughs> my exercise is parking my car in the furthest part of the parking lot and walking to my office every day. Or walking on the unit. Hate it. But I, that's my exercise. And learn from your emotions. That's the most important thing. And when you learn what they are, talk about it. Tell people how you feel. Make sure you use the I method, but then we'll talk about that. So let's learn how to reduce or manage our personal stress. How we perceive and respond to event, an event is a significant factor in how we adjust and cope with it. Um, the stress you feel is not only a result of your caregiving situation, but also your perception of it. You know, sometimes we get, I'm the only one who's taking care of mom. I've got seven sisters and brothers, and nobody ever comes over here to try to take care of mom for me. <laughs> but when they come and they say, I'm going to take mom to the doctor, no, uh-uh, because you know what? I forgot. i got to take him because i got to talk to him about this, this, and the. Well, why don't you just make them a list and let them take mom to the doctor? And then you go get your hair done. And go get a manicure or a pedicure or just do nothing. Look at the idiot box, as my grandmother used to say. Um, whether the glass is half full or half empty, that's important because you alone are there with your experience. And if you don't explain to these seven siblings that you have how you feel, they're never going to know. They're going to be coming in and out of the house thinking that everything is okay. We had this situation. My aunt moved from California because she was going to take care of my grandmother. She left her house in California. She was going to stay there and take care of my dear. We had my dear. We had my dear. After three weeks, she was ready to go back to California. <laughs> Nobody ever comes by here to help me. But you took on this responsibility. The five people who live here knew how much it was. <laughs> Nobody was offering to give up their house to move in. And now you know why. Well, we muddled through. It was hard at times because she blamed everybody and anybody <clears throat> for her decision to move. And we did have to learn to pitch in a little bit more. But you know, after you get so many calls at 3 o'clock in the morning, a mother going, hey, I'm really sick. Somebody needs to come get me. And I'm like, well, where is Annie? I don't know. She's not here. I, I don't see her. Okay. I did that three times. And then I was like, okay, look, I can't get out of my bed and I got to go to work the next morning. We got to do something. So everybody needs to work together. But you got to take care of yourself first. Level of stress is influenced by the number of factors including the following. Are they voluntary? Are you taking on more than you can handle? Mm -hmm. This is me. I have a problem saying no. You know why? Because my dear used to say, you never know if it's going to be your last time, so you always <laughs> say yes. <laughs> okay, well, guess what I found out? There'll be another time. <laughs> they will ask you again. So, you have to know when to say no. Volunteer. You have a choice in taking on the things that you take on. Um, relationships. Wow. Thank God I have one sister. That's all I need because she's the younger sister. And she gets away with everything because she's the one who's married. 
And of course, my parents can't ask her because she has a husband. <laughs> well, she has a husband, so she has an extra person, right? <laughs> so you have to ask these people in your lives for help. And that's the main thing you need, we need to realize because that helps to reduce your stress. These are coping abilities. How you cope with your stress in the past predicts how you cope with them now. If you keep things in, that's where they're going. I've learned how to release. Remember that one from the TV? Um, identify your coping strengths and the way you learn to deal with those. And then share those with your family so that when you say, I need five minutes just to go out in the backyard and scream, they don't think you're losing your mind. <laughs> um, situations. Some caregiving situations are more stressful than others. For example, caregiving for someone with dementia is often more stressful than caring for with than caring for somebody with a physical limitation. And let me tell you about my poor Aunt Annie who moved here from California and gave up her house. She gave up her house to care for my grandmother who has dementia, but also for her younger brother who had a physical limitation. He cannot walk. He's still in the house with Aunt Annie. Because my grandmother has since passed away. And with the house came the responsibility <laughs> of so now we don't hear as much that she has to deal with my dear because she doesn't have that dementia factor, she just has the physical limitations. And that's a lot less stressful for her. So coping um, abilities, caregiving situations, and if the support is available. And now everybody's a whole lot more willing to help because the physical is a whole lot easier than the, um, the dementia. So, steps. First step, accept the thing you cannot change. Most important thing you can ever, ever, that should be everybody's mantra. When you wake up in the morning, thank you Lord for letting me be here, please help me accept the things I cannot change. Because you can't change, you can't worry something right, that's my big thing, and you can't make someone behave the way you want them to behave. Only you can control the things that you can control. And as a caregiver, I cannot stress to you how important that is. So just remember that. And for those of you who are dealing with someone with dementia, don't argue. You will never win. That's right. Ever. <laughs> Ever. Their perception of reality is real. Those children playing in the garden are playing in the garden. Let them play until they go home. Okay, so you're never going to win that argument, and that's the most important thing I can tell you. You can't control it. Um, take some time for yourself. When they take a nap, if you enjoy a bubble bath, have a bubble bath. That's the most, if, if it's you got to go get your hair done, call your sister, say, hey, come take care of mama because I'm going to get married. But you got to have some time for yourself. There are programs around town, respite programs, take advantage of them. Even if it's a couple of hours, daycare programs, take advantage of them. I cannot tell you how important they are for your own well-being. Share your feelings with someone. That's why you're here. Support groups like this are so important because you never know what you will learn from someone else. Now, I used to think support groups were a little more quirky until I was diagnosed with lupus. And I was away from home with no one to talk to. The only thing I realized was it wasn't something I would die from. It was just inconvenient for me at the time. And I didn't know what to expect. So I went to a support group and I saw all these people and some just didn't look really good. And I thought, mm -mm, I'm not having this. But there were things that they taught me like, if you can, take a nap during the day. Or during the winter, always wear gloves because it helps your hands. Little things like that that I didn't know. So support groups, talking it out with people who were in the same situation, they help. Um, change negative thoughts to positive thoughts. And I know this can be the hardest thing when you're going through a rough time, but there's always a silver lining, and that is very important to 
avoid, let's say minimize. <laughs> minimize alcohol, tobacco, and caffeine. See, the reason I say minimize is because every morning I gotta have tea or I'm gonna be dragging through the day. So let's say minimize the use of those things. Um, because sometimes you just need a little kick. And for me, it's tea. Learn to say no, learn to say no, learn to say no. Do not continue to fill your plate with things that you know that you cannot do. And then when you fill your plate, because this is my mother, she says yes, says yes, says yes. And then when her plate is overflowing, she's mad at everybody else. Because she said yes. And you know, you're like, but you did it. So, and break cycles that aren't healthy. Little by little, you just learn to break them. Because they're going to be the key to helping you take care of yourself. Okay. There's, this is a long list. You have it. But these are just steps to help you manage your stress. Um, Stephen Covey is um, a person who's into time management and that sort of thing. And one of the things he says is the key is not to prioritize what's on your schedule, but to schedule your priorities. And so that's really important. Whatever is a priority to you, the person you're caring for is a priority, but you've got to be the priority over them. So take time to look at some of these things to make sure that you, you know, do some to manage your stress. Set goals. Setting goals or deciding what you would like to accomplish in the next three to six months is important to, to taking care of yourself. And here are some things that you might want to do. Take a break from caregiving. There are some great respite programs there. I mean, you know, even if it's a weekend, <coughs> you'd be surprised how, you know, how much fun you can have in a weekend. I have a friend, Vicki Mullins, at Rittenhouse, and it's funny when they run their special, like, buy a week, get a week, she says it's funny how those weeks are broken up during football season and vacation time. <laughs> she said that is hilarious to her, but that's when people want to use their respite time. So figure out when is a good time for you. If it's a friend who offers to take care of mama for you for a couple of days, even if she can't make grits and eggs like you, let her take care of mama for you for it. It could be a great birthday present. If she says, hey, for your birthday, I want you to go out and take a couple of days for yourself. I'm going to watch your mom. Take her up on it. You will really appreciate it. Get help with caregiving tasks like bathing and preparing meals. Programs all over the city. Um, you know, could probably put you in touch with them. Um, but there are some out there, and there's some really good people who know what they're doing, and they can help you with those things. Feel healthy. And goal and action steps. If the goal is to feel healthy, take steps to doing it. Maybe that's exercising, and that exercising could be walking a little longer. <laughs> it could be doing something more than walking. But set, set a step, make a plan, and make sure you follow up. Maybe it's taking a half hour break during the, you know, during the week and walking more than once or twice. Like I said, I'm not an exercise person. Seek solutions. Identify your problem. You know, if your problem is that you're a control freak, then maybe you need to relinquish some of the control. I always say, if the outcome is the same, to make sure mama has breakfast in the morning, and make, make sure she has grits and eggs, it doesn't matter who fixes them as long as mama eats them. So, if your husband says, don't worry, I'll fix grits and eggs this morning, Get you five minutes of sleep. <laughs> Let him do it. List possible solutions. Let the husband get up and have make breakfast. Select a solution from the list and put it into practice. Then evaluate the results. Did it work? Did mama like the grits and eggs? She did. Did she survive it? She did. She didn't have indigestion. She took the pink, the yellow, and the white pill. Everything was fine. You got five extra minutes. 
we shall try this again in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and then use other resources and accept the fact that your problem, your solution worked. And then maybe try it for lunch. Learn to communicate. This is really important that you use I messages rather than you, especially when you're trying to get help from other people. Don't say, okay, you're her child too and you should give me some help because I am sick and tired of always having to run over here and find out what's going on. More like, I feel that I'm always the one having to do this and I feel like it would be just a little more helpful if you took some responsibility too. You know, we are in this together. Sounds a little bit better. Um, respect the rights and feelings of others. If they say, you know what, not doing it. Okay. Well, I have to respect that, but you know, we'll see. There's going to be something else that I can find for you to do. And there may be. Some people just aren't comfortable caring for other people. So maybe you say, I have this list of things. Can you do that for me? I need to go to the drugstore. I need to do this. I need to do that. Maybe that's their comfort level. And that may be the thing. But, you know, don't get mad if they say they're not going to do any of them. Some people just aren't going to help. Be clear and specific and be a good listener. So if they say, look, this whole new Alzheimer's thing makes me really uncomfortable. I don't know how to talk to mom. I don't know who that person is. Okay, I understand that and I respect that. But you're never going to get more comfortable if you stay away. So you've got to be a good listener and respect what they have to say. This is hard for caregivers. They'll ask for help. They'll say, you never do this, you never do that. And when someone offers, well, no, thank you. I appreciate it. But you know what? I just think I'll, I'll do it myself. He, he won't go if I don't go with him. I hear that all the time. No, we, we, I promised I would never let them go to one of those facilities. I, I guess I'll just have to bring him home. Okay, but you're going to bring him home to what? He'll be back up here in three or four days because you can't take care of him. And what's fair is that you put him in a facility where they can be cared for and you can get some help or that you take him home and both of you are miserable. So you have to look at it half full, half empty. Um, consider the person's special interests or a person's special abilities and interests. Resist taking the same person repeatedly. So if you've got that friend who you know is your go-to girl, because they can't say no, don't ask them all the time. Just give them a break. <laughs> no. They're never going to tell you no. So you should give them a break. Have two go-to girls. Or maybe have a go-to girl and a go-to boy. But have, you know, a couple people. In your, or in your posse. That's what you should have, a posse. Um, pick the best time to make requests. Not at the last minute, like my mother does. You know, I forgot that I had this meeting and um, I need you to pick Rihanna up from camp because, yes, my mother at 72 decided she needed a child and she got foster. <laughs> Um, I forgot I had this meeting, and so can you please pick her from camp on your way home? And by the way, she probably hadn't had dinner, so can you do that too? Because she knows I don't. Um, prepare a list of things that need doing. And say, here's the list. Mom has a doctor's appointment on Thursday. We have to do this on Friday. She needs to have this done on Saturday. Who wants to do what? Whatever makes you happy, it would make me grateful. Be prepared for resistance or refusal or hesitance or whatever because not everybody's going to jump. Let me just tell you, they're not going to be um, happy to just help, especially family members. As they say, you moved from California. You were the one who left your house. You said you were going to come to take care of my deal, and guess what? You got it. <laughs> 
avoid weakening your request. Well, if you can't do that, can you do, maybe can you just uh, come for an hour? I know I said I needed to go to the doctors, but maybe I could reschedule if you could just come for an hour. If they can't do it, they can't do it. Find somebody else. That's what's important. When we talk to the physician, here's what's important. Prepare questions ahead of time. Doctor, I am not sleeping well. You know, my mom gets up in the middle of the night. I hear her rummaging through stuff. She turns on lights. I'm worried that she's going to turn on the stove. What can you do to help me sleep? Well, first you got to take care of mama's wandering and all of that stuff first. But have questions for the doctor already prepared so that you can be ahead of the game. Be like my granddad. Go to web, www.webmd.com. That's what I always say. Enlist the help of a nurse. You know, sometimes they know more than the doctor. He's going to schedule this test. Can you tell me what it's going to be like? How early should I be there? What should I do before I get there? What, I'm, what How am I going to feel after I leave? <coughs> Should I eat before? How long should I wait before I eat after? Those are things that the nurse can help you with. What is this medicine going to make me feel like? Anybody ever had a colonoscopy? <laughs> <laughs> the nurse. That's the, all those questions. Make sure your appointment needs are met. If it's better for you to have morning appointments, don't settle for one at 2 o'clock. You're not going to be your best. And you're not going to do the next thing, which is going to be on the next slide. You may not can get somebody to go with you. I never ask people to go to the doctor with me because they just get on my nerve. Um, the, the time of day that works best for you. So, um, and be sure to convey your reasons for your visit. Hey, especially, I do that. Hey, I'm having some problems. Um, I noticed that I'm swelling, I need to see what's going on, can you work me in? Or I have an appointment coming up but I think it's going to be too late, can you get me in? This is what's going on. Call ahead. How many people here go to Kirkland Clinic? How many times are they late? <laughs> Call ahead. Hey, is he on schedule? I don't really have a whole lot of time to wait today. I always do that. And usually his nurse is really good about telling me if he's 10 or 15 minutes ahead or behind. Take someone with you so that they can kind of trigger questions that you may have talked to them about and you may not have on your list. Now when I would take my grandmother and she would say, oh, I'm fine. Everything's wonderful. And I'm like, well, we just moan 15 minutes from the house. And her thing was, we don't want to bother him with stuff. And use assertive communication, I messages. I have been feeling terrible. I'm swollen. I can't get rings on. I've been taking prednisone for three weeks at this level. I feel terrible. What are you going to do for me today? Today. Because I can't walk out of here unless I have a definitive plan. Because I got to get on a plane in two weeks and go train some people. That's how you have to talk to doctors because guess what? You're paying them. <laughs> okay, start to exercise. These are some things that are supposed to be fun. <laughs> The legacy because my grandmother did it for me. Um, that's pretty much it. <laughs> but they're supposed to be fun. That's funny. We's fun. We is fun. If I could grow stuff, gardening may be fun. I got home last night, Debbie. You asked me about this. I got home last night and I bought a house because my parents said I needed to have an investment. 
and it has a yard. And I got home and the guy had been to cut my grass and I was like, it looks so pretty. <laughs> That's the only time it looks pretty. Fun. That was fun. Yeah, I don't do yard stuff. Yeah. I call them and go, hey, um, that, that funny looking grass stuff, I think it needs to be trimmed. He goes, okay. But, yeah. I have a brown thumb. But yeah, see, none of those things even board games my sister's in today. None of those. But now, I guess if I were going to exercise, that would be the thing that I would do. <laughs> it just doesn't. But this, write a legacy. It is so much fun to go back and read things from what my grandparents did. Um, and the way my grandmother did hers to me was in a cookbook. You don't cook. I don't cook. <laughs> so, six months after she was dead, my sister, and I'll tell you this quickly. My grandmother used to always say to me, the plumber is not going to take a debit card. You need to have cash in your house. I'm like, okay, I can write him a check. Well, um, one of the things she made sure that we got each, my sister and I, was a cookbook. So I had had this cookbook six months after she passed away. My sister said, have you looked in your cookbook? And I was like, no. She's like, you need to look in the cookbook. So I started going through the cookbook, and she had all these little sayings. When I was a girl, we did this. This is how you make the peach cobbler that you liked so much. And I would turn the page, and $50 fell out. Oh. Well, to make a long story short, there were all these little stories, and when I got to the end, I had $2,000. Wow. wow. You didn't even know. That I didn't know. Because you don't cook. Because I don't cook. <laughs> but you know what? I put all of it in the bank except for $500, because when the plumber comes, <laughs> there will be cash in the house. <laughs> Learning from our emotions. You need to um, make a change in your caregiving, caregiving situation. Um, and that is learning from your emotions. When you're upset, it's okay to be upset. It's okay to let people know you're upset. And it's okay to let them know why you're upset. Take some time and learn from those emotions. It's very important. Um, know that you're grieving for a loss. Know that you're experiencing stress. Whatever the emotion is, know what it is and learn from it. Express it, get it out. Those sort of things. It's, it's one of the reasons that you know you have those emotions. You gotta get them out. Ways to remain social. This is one way. Bridge checkers, have a group, book club, Bible study. Group. Um, attend church regularly and other social groups. Uh, until like they couldn't go anymore. My grandparents went to church. And the funny thing is my grandparents lived near Birmingham Southern, but they went to church off of Tallapoosa. And one day my grandmother said, there are 38 traffic lights between our house and church. I was like, Mom, they don't need the keys anymore. <laughs> Summing it up, look, learn and use anti-stress reduction techniques. Attend to your own health care needs. Get proper rest and nutrition. Exercise. <laughs> Take time off without feeling guilty. Everybody needs a mental health day. Sometimes you need a mental health hour in the middle of the day to go look at shoes like I do. <laughs> Participate in pleasant, nurturing activities. Seek and uh, accept support from others. Seek supportive counseling when you need it and talk to trusted, a trusted friend or counselor. And the other thing is journal. I journal a lot because that's a way for me to get things out. And besides, a friend told me once that when I was having insomnia, she said, you know, insomnia is God's way of trying to talk to you because you don't listen during the day. <laughs> so, when I can't sleep, I get in the corner, and I say, okay, I'm listening, and I journal. So, keep that.
that in mind. Identify and acknowledge your feelings. Change negative ways and thoughts into positive ones and set some goals. Any questions? How many are ready to go out and take care of yourself? <laughs> 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 